So what we found um, in the last video was we have now an expression for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. <clears throat> which basically says that there's now this there's a um, there's a restriction on position and momentum coupled together. We can have any position or any momentum we want, but for a, a quantum particle, um, those two things, our knowledge of them are is is what is has to be labeled by the uncertainty. So I can pick any position I want. I can have my particle at this position right here, but the the momentum that is run it it has now the measured momentum has some uncertainty to it. Um, and if this position is really small, if my knowledge of that position is really small, then my knowledge of the momentum is large. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so what, you know, as a nuclear and particle physicist, where this impacts me is particle decays. And when particles are stable, um, then when they, you know, it takes a long, long time for them to decay, then our knowledge of um, their energy um, is, is very well known. And so if I take something like the proton, the proton, for all intents and purposes, is a stable particle. We have not found in the four, in the 13.7 billion years that the universe has been in existence, we haven't had any evidence for a proton decaying. In fact, most theories that allow for the proton to decay, um, these some of these you know um, uh, grand unification theories in particle physics, they set the decay time for the part for the proton to be, you know, at um, much, much longer times, 20 billion years, 30 billion years. Um, and so the, the proton's um, lifetime is huge. And so we've never found a proton that decays. <clears throat> and so therefore, you know, um, we haven't seen it. If you want to think about other evidence, think how many protons are inside your body. You're, you're made of, you know, human beings are made mostly of water, I don't know, 80% of water, something like that, which contains two proton, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. So there you're talking like um, eight protons and oxygen, two hydrogens, 10 protons. Multiply by the, the Avogadro's number of particles in your body, and one of them should have decayed if, you know, um, you know, if the, if, even if the lifetime of the proton was a billion years, there's over a billion protons in your body. And so therefore, one of those billion must have had the opportunity to decay by now. And we haven't seen that yet. No one has died of proton decay. Um, we haven't seen anybody with any kind of radiation associated with proton decay. <clears throat> and so, you know, something is as stable as the proton, um, that means that its its decay time is really uncertain. It's large, so the delta t for the proton is astronomically large, but the delta e of the proton is very very small. And the interesting thing is that since you know, from what Einstein told us, e is equal to m c squared, then that not only is it the energy, but our, our knowledge of the mass of the proton is known really, really well. <clears throat> and so we know that we know the mass of the proton really, really well because its decay time is so astronomically large. Um, and that's true of all the subatomic particles. Um, the muons, the pions, the kaons, all of them are unstable particles which means they have something called a width in their mass. If we were to measure the decay of something like a muon, what we would find is that the mass of this would come out to be somewhere around 
um, I believe it's around 200 MeV per C squared, but there would be some uncertainty to it. We, our knowledge of the mass of the muon has an uncertainty called its width, um, which is essentially delta m. Um, and so that delta m is now related to the delta t of its decay. So it's really interesting that, you know, the how well we know the mass of a particle is related to how soon, how quickly it will decay. So let me take a look at one of the problems in the book. Um, this is problem 645. And what this problem says is you have an excited state of certain nucleus with a lifetime. So it has a lifetime. Delta T of. 5 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. <clears throat> Find the minimum possible uncertainty in the energy. All right, well, if I apply the uncertainty principle, delta T and delta E are greater than or equal to h bar over 2. We want the minimum one, so we're going to take the equal sign. Uh, and we get h bar over two, like so. <clears throat> okay, um, so how are we going to solve this? Um, well, this is in seconds, and so um, what, uh, um, so what we can do is we'll just plug in the value for h bar. Um, we could try some tricks like multiplying by c um, and such, but in the end I think we're just going to have a c laying around. Um, because there isn't a mass around. So this delta E is essentially h bar over 2 delta T. And so now if I look in the front cover of the book, I say what is h bar? And h bar is H bar. H bar is six point five eight times ten to the minus sixteen EV times seconds divided by the two times the time, which is five times ten to the minus eighteen seconds. So the seconds, um, let me clean that up a little bit so you can actually see what we're doing. So Planck's constant h bar is 6.58 times 10 to the minus 16 EV times seconds. So the seconds cancel. And what we're left with now is 6.58 times 10 to the minus 16 divided by 10 times 10 to the minus 18, <clears throat> which is essentially 10 to the minus 17. So what I get is 6.58 times 10 to the minus 16 plus 17 EVs, or 6.58 times 10. <clears throat> which gives me 65.8 EV. So that's the uncertainty in my um, energy. The interesting thing, again, is that they're talking about a nucleus. And in, in nuclear physics, the energies binding the nucleus together is on the order of MeV, millions of electron volts. And so if I had an energy level which was you know, 10 MeV, and the uncertainty is on the order of EVs, then the uncertainty in how well I know this energy level is, you know, almost, you know, one part in a million. So that's really, really good. <laughs> we know the, the decay of this, the lifetime of this energy state in the nucleus 
to one part in a million. So that's pretty good. But that's the usefulness of, of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It has all these kind of philosophical arguments going around about how well we know things and what is the observer's um, role in any measurement. But in the physics, the physics, what it's telling us is that it's telling us a lot about um, decays and how well we know something like the mass of a particle or the lifetime of a particle or how well are we ever going to be able to measure the energy state of a nucleus or an atom. So it's a really, really useful and handy relationship to have. Um, and then we can leave the interpretation of it to the philosophers.